Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. I have loved seeing um, a flurry of new followers come in in the last few weeks. Um, I wonder if some of you have been um, starting to follow because you saw that I am going to be having Dr. Daniel Amen, the Amen Clinics author of numerous, numerous best-selling recording of Quest to you, Dr. Raymond, uh, best-selling books. Um, and he was kind enough to join me today to talk a little bit about what we have all experienced in the last few weeks. Um, I call it the post-election hangover. Uh, Dr. Raymond, it's so good to see you. Hey. Hi. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Hey. It's so wonderful to see you as always. It's I love the little uh, earphones there. Can you hear me okay? I can. It's it's very faint, and I can't hear anyway. So, um. <laughs> well, this is a, the first time I've ever heard that I'm not loud. Um, <laughs> my biggest complaint is you're so loud. I'm like, I know, I know. I'm Italian. That's the way we are. Um, I, I, I was phone. saying that I'm so happy to have you on today because one of the things that I've been calling the the post election hangover. Um, but many people feeling post-election stress, um, no matter where you are politically, um, either half of you are popping champagne and dancing in the streets, which I, I have to say, it's wonderful to see the country celebrating um, anything right now. Um, and it, the others are very disappointed, frustrated. Um, there's a lot of mistrust. And I, and I ask you to start things off of just how do you, what advice do you have to reconcile some of these swinging emotions that we're feeling right now? You know, the thing that's going to help us survive this truly historically crazy time <laughs> is being adaptable. Uh, that's why humans have survived during uh, really tough times is we know how to shift from one state to another. And, um, the chronic stress since March has just eroded all of our serotonin. So serotonin is that neurotransmitter that helps us be happy. And when it's low, it causes us to become inflexible. And that is really the essence of suffering. When things don't go the way you think they should go, um, you suffer. Um, I have a friend uh, who says, argue with reality, welcome to hell. And I've just seen that so much in my patients. And one of the wild cards for post-election stress disorder is it happened when the time change happened. So we were already tired. We were already sort of our circadian rhythm was off. And then staying up late on Tuesday night because we didn't know what was going to happen. It just led to a funk for so many people. So um, get sleep. <laughs> Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I mean, it just <laughs> kept going. And that was what I think um, was hard for a lot of people. And even now when you see that it's not, 1000% resolved. I mean, we saw the president tweet this morning, we will win this. Um, it, it, it's a lot of uncertainty for people. When you say be adaptable, what advice do you have to, to sort of focus on letting go what you can't control? Well, I, you know, I think I have said the serenity prayer 600 times, you know, I teach it to all of my patients. And, and a lot of people think it's related to people who have an addiction problem. You know, they use it a lot at AA meetings. But it wasn't originally designed for that. It was originally designed to help people with difficult times. And it's the essence, I think, of mental health. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And a whole bunch of people think the election is not done in 2000. The election was not done for, <laughs> you know, over a month. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think being patient, 
going through the process. I think the Electoral College actually doesn't meet until December. And whatever happens, we are going to be okay. And just knowing that at your core will help you survive this difficult time. Um, just hearing you say that, I think for many people are comforting. Um, someone just asked a question, Dina7368. Thank you for asking this. So why do some people, and this is pivoting to the pandemic, why do some people have such a bad reaction than others in this pandemic? So there's a term I like called brain reserve which is the extra tissue you have to deal with whatever comes your way. And I first thought about it in people who um, survived car accidents or soldiers who survived blast injuries. It's like you can take two soldiers, put them in the same tank, expose them to the same blast, same angle, everything's the same. One of them walks away unharmed, the other one's permanently disabled. And you have to go, why? It depends on the brain health they brought into the accident. If one had played football, ate a lot of fast food, drank a lot of alcohol, the brain they brought into that accident wasn't very healthy. So in part, it depends on the brain we bring into whatever crisis we have. And the way to survive it is, and this is very different than most of my psychiatric colleagues, that you have to get your brain right, the physical functioning of your brain, and then your mind tends to follow. And so eating right, sleeping right. We talked about low serotonin, go with being cognitively inflexible. Exercise boosts serotonin as does a certain way to eat, which is foods that are high in tryptophan, the precursor for serotonin mixed with healthy carbohydrates. Because those foods like turkey by themselves doesn't get serotonin into your brain. You need a little um, insulin squirt in order to make that happen. So there's diet that can do it, certain supplements. I like one called 5-HTP, or my favorite of the bunch is, that I take is saffron. Uh, because saffron has been found in 21 randomized controlled trials to help with depression. And in the beginning of the pandemic, when I lost my dad, we had to close um, one of our clinics. We, had a, we have a clinic in Manhattan, and one of my young 28-year-old employees ended up on a ventilator mm. for six weeks. And I'm like, I'm taking saffron. This is too, yeah. Just <laughs> in fact, saffron the, 2.0. <laughs> yeah. In fact, the last time you and I did Instagram Live was the day after my dad died, which was, uh, you know, I don't know why that came back to me, but you were so sweet as you always are. And, well, it was, uh, it was one of the very first Instagram Lives that I did. And I think a lot of people were moved by your strength and your wisdom when it came to grief. So I thank you for sharing that with me here. Yeah. So, you know, I'm always working on getting my brain better because bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. and, and one of my favorite uh, quotes is in 1948, C.S. Lewis, so the author that brought us the Chronicles of Narnia and the screw tape letters in my favorite book of all times called The Great Divorce, uh, he wrote about the atomic bomb in 1848, and you could just completely just replace COVID-19 with oh, the atomic gosh. bomb. And he says, in many ways, we worry too much about the atomic bomb. You know, you could have lived in the 16th century in London where the plague visited us every year, or in the Viking age when you never knew if you were gonna wake up to someone slitting your throat. Let's not exaggerate the time we're in because guess what? All of us are condemned to death anyways. And if the bomb comes or if the virus comes, let it find us doing sensible and human things like reading, bathing our children, playing tennis, whatever. And, and I just love that because we can exaggerate how awful things are when eight out of 10 families say they're closer than they've ever been because parents have more time with children, because they're not fighting traffic 
um, yes, there are all sorts of stresses. I don't want to diminish that. But there are all sorts of blessings as well, especially if you're an introvert. If you're an introvert, you love this time because you don't have to be at the office with the other people that stress you out. You love being alone. I'm so much more of an introvert than I thought I was. You know, I went into the office, I was filling in for Robin and there was nobody there. And not that I don't love who I work with, they're lovely people. It's just, you know, when you don't have to make small talk and you're kind of like, this is kind of nice. I like sort of being <laughs> by myself and just having some quiet every once in a while. I don't want to glaze over the point that you just made when you were talking about, um, how we need to take this time and how we should be living our lives rather than looking at this in a catastrophe living type of scenario. Somebody chimed in here, pray for Honduras. You know, you have Hurricane Ada, you have the pandemic, you have this uncertainty when it comes to half of the people that voted in this election. You have so many, so many things. Yet your point is when you look at the past, pales in comparison to what we all are experiencing now. And I just want to really get that point across to people when you are saying how it really is savoring the time that you have rather than worrying about the problems that are before you. Well, you know, and I worry about you because any news anchors where they're talking about negativity over and over and over and over, that sort of, you get something I call compassion fatigue. You know, that's what psychiatrists get. And you really have to work to take care of your mind so that all that negativity doesn't begin to seep into your cells because there's so many beautiful stories coming out of the pandemic as well. And I even remember the day my dad died, the interaction between the police officer and my mom was just mm. so cute and so special. And he was just such a wonderful uh, person that, you know, if I let my mind think on those things, I feel balanced. And if I just focus on what's wrong, I feel wrong. And so where you bring your attention always determines how you feel. And one of my strategies, I stole it from somebody, I don't remember who, but before you go to bed at night, um, so what I do is I say a prayer and then I go, what went well today? And I do that every night. And since I've been doing this for years, the night my dad died, I did that. And, you know, part of my brain is like, seriously. And, yeah. But I just, I did it. And it just helped me go to sleep that night, which I always say with grief, fix sleep first. Because if you don't sleep, every negative thing becomes magnified. And then another fun technique um, is give your mind a name. And that way you can separate from it. And I named mine after my pet raccoon when I was 16. <laughs> I had a pet raccoon. And her name was Hermie. I actually didn't know she was a girl until she got pregnant. And... Hermie used to talk incessantly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just like over and over again and didn't say anything. At least I had no idea what she was saying. And so I named my mind that. So when I can just notice the chatter and I can choose to pay attention to it or not to pay attention to it. And uh, it's just, it's a fun little strategy that works so well. One of my patients yesterday named her mind Ursula, you know, <laughs> the evil witch from uh, um, Little Mermaid. I love doing Instagram lives with you because I always learn something fascinating <laughs> about you. A pet raccoon, that, that top, tops the charts. Um, when you talked a little bit about people like me and consuming information, I don't think I'm really any, uh, any different than the typical news consumer. I mean, I, I have to deliver it, but everybody is constantly reading their news feed. They're constantly looking at comments on Instagram, bombarded with it. And it's really why I started All Good Things. It's why I started this in, in bringing people on that promote positivity, that gives us content that makes us feel fuller. It's, it's, where, it's how I um, did exactly what you're talking about in handling all, all of the negative. Why not bring 
positive things forward and bring solutions. One question that actually I'm getting from A. Bellingfield is my question for Dr. Amen is, does he think it's all in the brain? Is suffering just in the brain? So when you think of suffering, think of four big circles, that there's a biology to suffering, like there is a biology to happiness. And they're sort of opposite uh, of the same thing, right? If your pleasure circuits become uh, low, then you just find no joy and you become apathy. If the pain circuits become high, you feel awful. Um, but there's also a psychology to it where you bring your attention determines how you feel. And if you bring it to all the painful things, you're going to feel pain. There's a social aspect to suffering. Like when you lose your father, you lose a child or you lose your business, uh, which is so common. Um, and there's a spiritual aspect to suffering. If you don't have a sense of meaning and purpose, then um, pain hurts more uh, if you can't put it into a context. And so I think suffering, you really have to look at it in all four of those circles to understand it. I have one friend um, who has a terrible brain. <laughs> she has the brain of a murderer, but yet she's one of the most peaceful what does the brain people. What a murderer look like? Oh, we really low my brain so that, uh, I'm comforted. <laughs> yes, you are not going to ever kill anybody. I cannot get you off if you <laughs> kill someone. Uh, my friend, Katie, I can get off if she kills somebody. Um, but yes, she's so peaceful because she really has that spiritual sense about herself that no matter what happens, she loves what is. In fact, she wrote a book called Loving What Is, which is one of my favorite books of all time. No matter what situation you're in, in this moment, do you have everything you need to manage the situation? And the answer for almost all of us is yes. And you wrote the book that's right behind you, The End of Mental Illness. I've seen a lot of people chiming in here and commenting. It's really beautiful to see because you're talking to each other and, and saying, DM me, I can help you. Um, it's really beautiful to see the kind of community that can exist on Instagram. So thank you to all the viewers. But in your book, The End of Mental Illness, people have been asking questions about medications um, versus things like supplements and some of the things that you talk about, exercise and sleep. What is your, and I know you talk about it extensively in the book, Book, take on the difference between the two and when you need to be medicated? So the big winner in the pandemic is the pharmaceutical companies that produce psychiatric drugs. The incidence of depression was 8% in March. It's 28% now. I mean, literally more than tripled. And a lot of people rush to medication and I rush to get your brain healthy. Now, I'm not opposed to medicine. If the natural things don't work in, say, a month, then medication is completely an option. But again, head to head against antidepressants, saffron has been shown to be equally effective. So why not start there? Head to head against antidepressants. Omega-3 fatty acids in a study from New Zealand were actually found to be more effective. So why don't we start? with saffron and omega-3 fatty acids. Another study, exercise, uh, compared to Zoloft, a really good antidepressant. At 12 weeks, they were equally effective. At 10 months, exercise beat the socks off Zoloft. And there are no side effects to exercise. They're good effects. I mean, in the exercise, it was super simple. Walk like you're late, 45 <laughs> minutes, four times a week. Also, um, learning how to not believe every stupid thing you think. So treatment called cognitive behavior therapy, I call it killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness found to be equally effective. So if, if you're tracking with me, saffron, omega-3 fatty acids, exercise, and learning how to not believe everything you think, why not try that before you reach for Lexapro? Um, but if they don't work, you also have to make sure you check your thyroid because low thyroid triggers depression. 
uh, you had Tana on, my wife, with her new book, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child. And when she went through thyroid cancer surgery, they took away all of her thyroid, which they don't do anymore, but it triggered a major depression. And so let's just work to get our brains and our bodies right. And then if we still need medicine, great. Now, I'm not a fan of the anti-anxiety drugs like Xanax and Clonopin and Valium and Ativan because once you start them, you can't stop them. And I don't like that. Um, so I like GABA, uh, theanine, magnesium. Uh, and in the end of mental illness, there's a whole chapter on mind medicine versus nutraceuticals. And I'm like, not opposed to medicine, but if you're depressed, do these 10 things first. Or if you're anxious, do these 10 things first. If you're not sleeping, because once you start Ambien, really hard to stop. And the medicine can be a bit insidious. And once you start it, they change your brain to need them. And I went to this lecture once by um, the founder of Paul Mitchell, uh, John Paul DiGiorio. And he always, he said, you don't ever want to be in the order business. You want to be in the reorder business. <laughs> And that's what <laughs> pharmaceutical companies bet on. It's not like an antibiotic. You'll you know, get rid of your strep throat. It's like once you start this, you won't stop it. And I'm not a fan of that. I'm a fan of let's get the organ of happiness, your brain healthy. And, uh, you know, yeah, if you need it, great. Not the first thing to think about. Uh, and your book has all of that information, the end of mental illness, when it comes to what exactly you can do beforehand before you look at that. Um, Delissa Richard Wellness is is chiming in, asking the question, I saw Dr. Amon's post today about removing people that disrupt your peace. What does he say about the people who claim this is intolerant or immature? This is so timely because, you know, all these political posts that you see that may differ from your politics or whatever, and you're just sick of seeing people and you may unfollow them or something like that. And so if somebody may say, hey, that's, that's not tolerating different opinions or be more mature and get over it, what would you say to them? Um, if they're toxic for you, it's just like pollution. Um, now, I, I would never say get rid of somebody of a different political persuasion, um, because that is intolerant. But if they're jackass about it, <laughs> then um, I have, excuse me for saying this, but I read, I read a book once from a Stanford professor, and it was called The No Asshole Rule. And so I have that at work. It's like, I don't get to be an asshole, and you don't either, that I hire people who tend, I call it KCP, kind, competent and passionate and you know you get to choose who you hang out with yeah. and if someone is chronically disrespectful no i mean i'll see them as a patient at least for a bit uh, right because it's my job but it's not who i'm going to tolerate hanging around day in and day out people are like the flu that they're contagious either in a good way or a bad way, and having appropriate boundaries is absolutely essential. So the people I get to choose, my friends and members of my extended family, I believe in the no asshole rule. Because if you don't set appropriate boundaries and you just let people walk on you, well, guess what? You're teaching them to walk on you. Now, that's different in you have conservative beliefs or you have liberal beliefs or, you know, I mean, you, you want to listen. And you probably see this because I see this on news stations all the time. People have terrible thinking patterns that they mm -hmm. label other people. I mean, that's what we call, psychiatrists call it cognitive distortion, mm -hmm. right? Whenever you label someone, you lump them with all the people you know like that, like Trump supporter. I hate that because they go, well, everybody's the same. And mm -hmm. they're incredibly thoughtful people who supported the president and they're com incredibly unthoughtful people. Mm -hmm. And the same thing's true on the other side. Mm -hmm. Whenever you label someone, you lump them and you can't deal with them. 
And I see this on news stations all the time, and it's just not helpful. You get people yelling and screaming at each other. It's bad thinking that leads to the division. And there's actually an interesting study on people either far left or far right. They're rigid in their mm -hmm. thinking. And what did we just talk about? People who don't survive the pandemic are not flexible. And so I think this cognitive flexibility is really important to work on. Let's all remember that Thanksgiving day when we're surrounded by, you know, Aunt Susie that might have the different opinion than you, uh, that you can still be with those as long as they're not an asshole, as Dr. Raymond said. He said it first, so I can <laughs> say the A word. It's not cable, uh, you know, it's Instagram Live, we're about to say it. Um, I, I love this question that Duchess of Whimsy has because um, it, it, is, it is a separate topic, but I think this is true for a lot of people. She says, how do you set a mind frame to stop attracting toxic people if you're a healer, right? H have you ever had those people that they just wanna fix someone and so they tend to take someone on that is a toxic, toxic person. And it tends to be a bit of a cycle for them. Um, how do you get out of that cycle? Uh oh, you froze just a bit. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so you, you have to be careful. Um, now I'm a psychiatrist. And at Amen Clinics, we see 7,000 patients a month. And often when they come to see us, they're really struggling. And so I think having patience, and I always tell my doctors, the first year is the hardest because everybody you see is new and, and they are sicker. But over time, as people get better, you know, you have a group of people that are really sick, a group that are getting better and a group that's really well that you just love seeing. So it's about being patient and having balance. Um, and then making sure that's not your whole life, uh, that when you go home, hopefully you go home to people that actually like you and are reasonably respectful for you. It's, it's people really burn out when everywhere they turn, it's stressful for them. Um, you and I, when we were sort of confirming this this morning, you noticed the same thing I did about in the news we're now seeing that those who have COVID may face mental health issues down the road, separate from the pandemic giving people mental health issues, but the actual virus. As a psychiatrist and a brain expert, why is that, do you think? Because the virus also attacks the brain. The brain is one of the organs. The virus tends to set up shop. And you remember early on, one of the symptoms of COVID is you lost your sense of smell and taste, which means it's affecting your central nervous system. And uh, I, I'm going to do um, a webinar on immunity later today. And I always say your best defense against COVID-19 is your immune system and your brain, which means you're making good decisions, right? You take it seriously. This is not innocuous. It's not the flu. And you make good decisions. But then you optimize your vitamin D level. You take 20 milligrams of zinc. You take extra vitamin C. All of those things just or supporting your immune system and reminding your mind, you know, I need to do good things for my immune system, which means you're not drinking very much alcohol. That trashes your immune system. You're not eating bad food, which upsets your gut. Gut health has 60% of the immune tissue in your body. So really taking your brain is critical during this time. And isn't that funny? Because we all make a, a joke about the COVID-19 uh, pounds, right? Because everybody's drinking and eating more. And, and your point is, that's actually the most important thing that you should be focusing on is reducing alcohol and focusing on good health and eating. Right. And the chronic stress we're all under puts fat on your belly. I mean, I hate that part. It was, I don't know, I think it was like June, I just noticed my clothes were tighter. And so I actually put a tape measure around my waist and I'd put on two pounds, um, two inches around my waist and not like two or three pounds, 
But I was horrified. And so I got really strict with what I ramped up my exercise and I lost that. But I just know that's what cortisol does. So cortisol is that stress hormone that when you're faced with danger, you're faced with uncertainty, cortisol goes up, which makes you hungrier. And, you know, we just need to be more diligent about loving ourselves. And people go, but I love Rocky Road ice cream. And it's like, yeah, but it doesn't love you back. But I and love red wine. <laughs> yes, but I it know. does not love you back. And I don't know if you've ever been in a bad relationship. I've been in bad relationships. <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. I am not Let's doing that end, anymore. <laughs> I am only going to be in love with people or foods that love me back. And speaking of the person that loves you back, your amazing wife, Tana, um, was on Instagram Live with me. Her book is coming out January 5th, is it? But there's a pre-order that people can go to. It's Relentless Courage, um, and it's relentlesscourage.com. Is that right? Um, and Dr. Amen, I have just always looked to you as just such a wealth of information. What started as just one segment on my show turned into a week on my show, turned into a great friendship where you just continue to give so much to the audience. And I'm grateful for that. Well, I'm grateful for you and for what you do, but just our friendship and um, help me spread the word that, you know, it's not mental illness, it's brain health, get your brain right, your mind will follow. And it impacts not just you, but also your babies and your grandbabies. So you are, you are, we think about, I think that. about that. Yeah, I think about that all the time when it comes to being a mother is your children are watching you and, and we have a responsibility to them to be the best versions of ourselves. Uh, people are chiming in here left and right, how much they love hearing from you and please save this live. I will, I'm gonna be saving this live. I'm gonna be posting it on the, my Instagram, but also on my website, lynnsmithtv.com um, and giving it to Dr. Amen so he can post it on his website and Instagram as well. Cause these are such great tips, important information for all of you out there. Dr. Amen, as always, thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. Look Take forward care. to Talk soon. talking to you soon.